Solomon is a four and a half meter man eater, a saltwater crocodile, and he belongs to Rob Breddle. He lives in his wildlife park near the town of Ely Beach in Queensland, and is the largest one there. Rob Breddle has looked after him for more than 14 years now. 14 years ago, the wildlife authorities trapped Solomon because he was a rogue. He set up home near people. He was eating the dogs, and it was only a matter of time before he ate the people too. So, by chance, they sent him to Rob Breddle's zoo. Come on. I hatched Solomon from an egg and raised him in a farm for a year and then let him go into the wild. We did this with several hundred of them. By right, that should have been the end of this story. But 14 years and 500 kilometres later, I got him back. During his 14 years in the wild, Solomon travelled from Pompera north along the coast more than 500 kilometres to Bamaga, near the tip of Cape York Peninsula. He was captured here as a rogue. How do I know he's one of my babies? He took two weeks to feed after I got him. He was eating from my hand six weeks after I got him. In all of my years, I've never seen or ever heard of any crocodile settling into captivity so quick. In fact, other large crocodiles have taken up to eight months to feed and others have actually died without ever feeding. You might think that he was the only easygoing crocodile, but what clinched it for me was he had this toe missing. And that's the toe we cut off as a marking system for our free range crocodiles. So he's not easy going. <laughs> That's my bucket you've got there, mate. Come on, keep coming around. Come on. Come on. This is the missing toe, and that's the good foot. But that's not what Solomon's famous for. He is famous for something else. Three years ago, he tried to eat my niece, Carla. A three-hour plane flight from Ely Beach takes us to remote Pormpera and the Edward River Crocodile Farm. Here's where it all began for Solomon, on the shores of the Gulf of Carpentaria, in the Edward River Crocodile Farm, back in 1972. Boy, does that bring back some memories. When we got here, nearly all of the crocodiles had been shot out. In fact, the river just down there, the Chapman, had one crocodile left. That was all. The most amazing thing is, if it wasn't for my father, who convinced the Australian National University to fund this crocodile farm back in 1972, at a time when it was thought that this sort of thing would be impossible, because so little was known about the crocodile, Solomon wouldn't be here today. He's only got one eye. No, no, Rob Breddle chases no, no, the protective no, no, no. female from her nest. January usually marks the beginning of the nesting season at Edward River Crocodile Farm. More than 150 nests will be collected, each containing about 50 eggs. Many nests are those of the females hatched or caught by Rob more than 25 years earlier. This is why crocodile farms work so well. About 50 eggs in this nest, protected from flooding and predation, nearly all of them will hatch 
and nearly all the young will survive. Now in the wild, it's almost the opposite. Nearly all of these eggs and young won't make it. Now, this crocodile here, if she lives for her 70 years, she will lay about three to 4,000 eggs. And in the wild, only three or four must make it. She only has to replace herself and her mate with a couple of spares. Three or four out of 3,000 have to make it, so yeah. You know. Otherwise we're overrun with crocodiles. Actually, it does me heart good to see this, you know, to see that all those years ago, 29 years ago, we started this and you see that many nests, you think, wow, you know. It's very satisfying, I can tell you. You know, we reckoned we were going to save them and I reckon this is the only way to go. I mean, farming's really the way to save them, you know, it really is. The success of the Edward River Crocodile Farm ensured the future of the crocodile in Australia. But no one knew this when Solomon was just an egg. Solomon was one of the very first crocodiles raised at the Edward River Croc Farm. It all begins when Rob's father, Joe Breddle, with the help of Ned Edwards and Stingray Barney, collect him as an egg during the first shaky year of operation. It's not long after Rob Breddle joins them for the next nesting season to help scour the rivers for the few remaining crocodile nests. At this time, the crocodile in Australia is an endangered species after the skin shooters have done their job. With so few crocodiles left, egg collecting seems the fastest way to create a large breeding population to produce the thousands needed for the skin trade. This is so successful that the farm secures its breeders and thousands for skinning in just a few seasons. For a young Rob Breddle, this is the beginning of an undying love affair with crocodiles and the bush. Tough crocodiles do not produce tough eggs. They must be placed right way up. Otherwise, the developing embryos will die. Stingray Barney has passed away now but he's one of the last hunters to depend on his spear and his knowledge to survive in the bush. Canned food never replaces a good feed of flying fox or barramundi. The only way to hatch the egg harvest is to build nests. Incubators have never been used to hatch crocodile eggs and there's no electricity to power them. In 1972, a driven Joe Breddle is determined to make the farm successful and preserve the crocodile. He's determined to show skeptical scientists it'll work. In doing so, he lays the foundation for today's multi-million dollar crocodile farming industry. The technique works. Around 90 days later, open nests reveal the hatchlings. Part of this batch of 1972 is skinned, while others remain as captive breeders. After a year, they release the rest to replenish the wild population. 1972 also sees the release of the very first farm generation raised to repopulate the wild a year old and toe-clipped. This marks the end of the decline of the crocodile in Australia. It's their second chance and it works. They liberate dozens into the Chapman River to grow and spread. They're more than a year old. One is Solomon. Small as he is, his size is now the key to his survival. There you go, big fella. Huh. Sitting next to the gate. Let to go over the top, eh? Hmm. 
when it comes to playing with crocodiles, size is really important. Because the bigger they are, the easier they are to play. <laughs> You can see when he came around, he was about one bucket away. And he just got a bit closer then. But when they're like this, size does matter, people. When crocodiles get over a certain size, they can't suck their toe anymore. So where I am is quite safe. Like I see, one bucket away is what it is. <laughs> and one bucket width is important. It's a matter of getting or not being got. If you're going to do this, always measure your crocodile first. Make sure he is longer than three and a half metres, because around three and a half metres he can actually bite his back leg. Over three and a half metres he can't. He can only get one bucket away. Starting to wear out, aren't you, mate? When Solomon was caught, he was about the size of this one. In fact, king of the river. He had most of the territory and most of the females. When it was born, he was only half the size of this one here. And he was about as thick as my thumb. And anything that could swallow my thumb could eat him. The first few months of life for hatchling crocodiles are tough. No matter where they hide, something bigger than them is sure to be looking for a meal. But even here, predators exist who find mangroves little obstacle to the hunt. Water pythons easily prey on the annual harvest of the baby reptiles. The weak and the sick are first victims. Survival strategy for hatchlings is simple. Stay hidden and stay still. The smallest movement will attract attention. Birds, fish, snakes and other crocodiles prey on hatchlings if they find them. A single river system may contribute many thousands annually and few ever survive. But they still have to move. They still need to hunt to eat. Food for baby crocodiles is as simple as it gets. The only things small enough to eat are insects and baby fish. Each day of their life is a lethal game of hide and seek. Movement means two things. There is something to eat, or something to eat them. Two years after Solomon was let go, we had a cyclone.
and a huge flood. And that's when I reckon he was washed out into the gulf right here. Once in the open waters of the Gulf of Carpentaria, Solomon turned right heading north. He was comfortable in the open sea. Only the saltwater crocodile and the American crocodile are so well adapted to an estuarine environment. Saltwater crocodiles range from India to Fiji, being sighted a thousand kilometers from land. For Solomon, a trek half this distance along the coast was a leisurely swim over several years. I've been following this little crocodile for some time now, and he's pretty stuffed. Now, that's about the size Solomon was when he actually got washed into the ocean at Edward River. Now, he had to spend quite a lot of time at sea, going from Edward River to Bamaga. But he always had to come into the rivers because saltwater crocodiles can't live without fresh water. He's off again. While Solomon entered rivers and creeks for water and food, he was always in danger from larger crocodiles. They controlled the rivers and were his main predators, so his stays were brief. In these times, he learned to hunt and to hide. Solomon, like any other crocodile out there, has two main reasons for living. Feeding and breeding, that is hunting and territory. But that's just about like any other animal out there. That includes us. But crocodiles are a bit luckier than most others. They sort of live in a hotel with room service. Just about everything they eat either lives with them or has to drink. But they've got a bit of a problem. Just about everything they eat is faster than them. So they've had to develop a few skills to overcome this problem. They need only eat once every two or three months depending upon their size. And really big crocodiles can go for years without food. They can also stay motionless, unseen for hours. All that really does is allows him to get close enough to catch the animal. But even that's not enough. An alert animal would still escape. It has to do one last thing and that is touch the water. The morning calm gives no hint of the titanic struggle a day before. But the increasing smell attracts a gathering of crocodiles, goannas, dragon lizards and flies. They tell us something happened. The cow was grabbed by a huge crocodile while drinking. He dined on the head and neck and left the rest. Now the others gather to clean up the remains. It's a cautious gathering, where, except for the flies, size takes precedence. This huge crocodile struggles to break up the carcass in the deep water. He relies heavily on his perforating teeth to loosen the flesh. After just a few bites, the crocodile is full but exhausted by the rolls and wrenches. He may not eat again for a month. The rest is left for the others. These Gulf river systems attract rich varieties of life and not far away, 
a colony of red flying foxes takes to the evening sky by the hundreds of thousands. Such large populations not only nourish environments as nocturnal pollinators, but the sick and dying nourish the rivers and the crocodiles. Life is very much a lottery for residents of rivers and billabongs. Crocodiles remain so still and quiet, so much a part of the landscape, they're easily overlooked. No matter how cautious, this snake neck cormorant can never be quite sure when it'll get that bit too close. The royal spoonbill is wary. A long watching game between crocodile and bird is over. Impatiently, the predator tests the prey for signs of weakness. Missing a meal is not a problem this time. There'll be many other opportunities before it needs to eat. At the end of a long dry season, before the effects of the first summer storms, rivers and waterholes focus populations of wildlife. Agile wallabies gather in the late afternoon to forage. By now most of their food has dried or burnt. Some dig for the remaining moist roots of burnt grasses. Others graze the lush green herbage near the edge of the water. The crocodiles miss none of the activity. Wallaby is fast food for a crocodile. They come in just the right size and flavor. But agile wallabies are alert, instinctively wary. They're safe close to the water if they're vigilant. Nothing will persuade them to enter. The crocodile's chance can only come when and if the wallaby drinks. They drink, but infrequently. The crushing jaws of the big male kill the wallaby instantly. The activity attracts another crocodile. It's his female. He blows bubbles to warn her off. There's no need to rush. He needs to recover his depleted energy levels. Crocodiles are power athletes, built to produce short bursts of high energy. They have little endurance. His female will get the scraps. Little change marks springtime in Northern Australia. Temperatures begin to rise, early storms occasionally develop, and a handful of plants may flower. This year, the grass trees are blooming, and the greenies and rainbow lorikeets harvest the pollen and nectar. It's mating time, and this male crocodile reveals a remarkable behavior. He's trying to attract a female to mate with. The male crocodile on the surface is mating with a submerged female. He mates with as many as he can in a season and guards his territory by driving off all other males. The activity lasts until the female breaks off.
The raised head is a gesture of submission to the male. But there's little time to linger. Another of the group's females drives her away, already defending her future nesting territory. So this was life for Solomon for many years. And we know much of it was spent along the coast near an unusual island. I've always had one nagging problem about Solomon being one of the babies I let go in 1972. How did he get so big so quick? Now in captivity, that wouldn't be a problem. With daily feeding, he can do it. In the wild, that's another story. Now, there is one place I've heard of that might be the answer, and I'm off to find out. Strong southeast trade winds near the tip of Cape York Peninsula pummel Crab Island for most of the year. This sandy island endures the wind's constant onslaught to form one of the world's most important turtle breeding grounds. Three of seven turtle species breed here, but by far the most common is the flat-backed turtle. The flat-backed turtle is essentially unique to Australia, with its feeding grounds only extending as far as New Guinea and Indonesia. Hatchling flatbacks are also different. They spend their first years within about 15 kilometres of the coast. All other species lose themselves in oceanic space. On Crab Island, almost every day of the year, from late afternoon through the night to early morning, female turtles and babies trek the beach. This continuous activity is a powerful enticement to predators. The peaceful dawn belies the frenzied activity of the night and sees the last of the flatbacks laying 50 or so eggs. The day is quiet. The rufous night herons and pelicans have long finished gorging on the previous night's harvest of baby turtles. But hazards for young turtles are not only confined to the predators. On a beach where they dig many hundreds, nesting sites are crowded. This female has exposed a batch of brand new hatchlings while digging her egg chamber. The absence of the usual nocturnal predators means most will survive. Crab Island is not only a magnet for nesting turtles and predatory birds. All this continual activity has also attracted crocodiles. They have made the island home. The huge black male crocodile killed the turtle. Its unlaid eggs spill onto the sand. He brought it into the shallow water to break it up. This female crocodile is waiting for her turn. The plentiful supply of turtles means crocodiles here do very well. The more food they eat, the faster they grow. Today, this area supports numbers of very large crocodiles.
Local fishing guide Gary Wright drops Rob Bredel on the island. Gary has roamed the area for years and has no shortage of reports about big crocs. This large concentration of nesting flatback turtles could be the reason. These tracks here are from a crocodile about the size I reckon Solomon was when he got to this island. Somewhere between one and a half and two metres. Now I reckon this little fellow went up there last night, had a feed of baby turtles on high tide. We've probably got the start of another Solomon here. While most of the egg laying and hatching occurs in darkness, there's always some activity early morning or late afternoon. As he watches one of the early morning stragglers, Rob Reddle begins to understand just how many turtles must lay on this small stretch of beach. Those are not her eggs she's digging up. She's just digging her own egg chamber and she'll be laying in a minute. Now, there are so many turtles coming up onto these beaches to lay their eggs, this often happens. This is in fact the largest flat-back turtle rookery in the world. Like all egg-laying reptiles, this turtle has gone into a state of torpor. At this point, she's at her most vulnerable. This is to ensure that the eggs go down properly, so the next generation has the best chance of survival. Further along the beach, Rob notices one unusual track in a sea of turtle tracks. From the size of the footprints and the width of this track here, this was a two and a half metre crocodile. There's no prizes for guessing where he's been. Now the tracks in the sand here show me but the croc walked up, caught a little turtle coming down here, then he walked back up into there and sat where they were coming out of the ground and had a bit of a smorgasbord. And early this morning, they're still coming out of the ground. The first swim of their tiny life is through solid sand up to a metre deep. Almost paradoxically, on this island, daytime hatchlings have a better chance of survival. The nocturnal hordes of night herons have retreated to the dense mangrove forests and the crocodiles to the sea. This beach and these little fellows have answered one of the questions I've always had. If Solomon was one of the crocodiles we let go from Edward River. It had always puzzled me how he got so big, so quick. Now on this beach, every day, hundreds of these little fellows hatch and make their way to the water. And I'm pretty certain that Solomon would have grown up here. I think I'll give these fellows a head start. Solomon's good life ended when he left the island to set up a breeding territory. By chance, he chose a place near people. And that's a big mistake for a big crocodile to make. At Edward River Crocodile Farm, Rob Breddle looks up his old mate, him. Him is the largest crocodile he ever caught, and Good at 5.3 metres, he's one of the largest in captivity. Good boy. Good boy. Hang on.
If Solomon had stayed on Crab Island, chasing fish and turtles, he'd have been okay. But he decided to go to the mainland, set up a territory in a creek near where people live, chased all the other big males out, only kept his females, and everything else there, including people and dogs, were just food. He then became a rogue. And it was inevitable that he was going to end up either dead in a farm like this or in a zoo like mine. So your dad told, me, told you about some stories when we were catching crocodiles, did he? Yeah. Right. Here at the mouth of the Chapman River, a couple of crocodiles have been causing a bit of a problem. They're not real big. A couple of dogs have gone missing and one of them's actually came up and taken fish off the line. It's about two and a half metres long, not big, but he could become a rogue. So we're going to teach him a lesson. We're going to catch him. The best way to do this is with a harpoon, Gavin. We stick this little thing on the end of a spear. We punch it in through him. It just goes through his skin and just hangs on. It won't come off. It won't come off, mate. Just pokes into the spear right there. Yeah. And once we got him, we got him on a line. Then we just play him like we play a fish. Peter Mowat, the farm manager, works with Gavin Kendall. Gavin is the grandson of one of the original crew of crocodile catchers for the Edward River Crocodile Farm. He's 21, a first-time crocodile catcher, and wants to learn Rob Reddle's harpooning techniques. Just like you and me dad used to do. They'll just catch this one and let it go. Yeah. After an experience like this, no one will see the young croc for years to come. Yeah. Look here, From now on, there's not an ounce of rope left in it. There we go. One little fella. When they caught Solomon, he was a lot bigger, more than four meters, and a lot more dangerous. He was a potential man-eater and had to be removed. Protected by law, he couldn't be shot. <laughs> The wildlife authorities sent Solomon to Rob Reddle Zoo, a type of crocodile heaven. You might be forgiven for thinking this old rogue is tame, docile as a pussycat, but this is a mistake. If you are ever unlucky enough to be grabbed by a big crocodile like Solomon, it should be it, dead and eaten. There are really no second chances with an animal that size. Now, when he grabbed my niece, Carla, it should have been it. And it very nearly was. Rob Bradle explains why his crocodiles are so dangerous, although they're well fed and live in crocodile heaven, and why Solomon attacked his niece, Carla. I'll bet you thought he was trying to eat me. He wasn't. But if it had got me, he'd have carved me up all right. Eating me would have been an afterthought. All he was doing was trying to chase me out of his territory. Now, I treat my crocodiles here like another crocodile. So if I'm not feeding them, I'm in their territory. So they chase me out. If eating me was on his mind, he would have come to me under the water so I couldn't see him, to get as close as he could before attacking. Um, at the time I turned him around and I walked back, I it was um, raining, it was very muddy, and I just slipped over. It was one of them things where I just fell over in the wrong place at the wrong time, and, and I fell over right in front of him. And I had time to get around onto my stomach and to try and crawl away, but he just got me on that, that side. He must have just grabbed me. I'm going to show you how lucky Carla was. I'm going to throw this in and get a crocodile only half Solomon's weight to shake his head. just down there. 
There he is. Come on. Oh, he's got to do the roll first. Huh? Ah! <laughs> oh, look at that. Now, the reason he's rolling is because I give him a few pulls. He's trying to break a piece off because he thinks it's a large animal. Look at that. You see that squirrel when he shakes? I mean, it doesn't look that fast the way that he shakes his head, but my God, there's some power in there. Look at that. Now the rolling's only to break a piece off. He thinks it's too big to shake. He's got to go. No, he's got it. And that was a chook tied about four times for his body. Whew. That's just raw power there, people. Raw power. And remember, he's only half the size of Solomon. So you can see how lucky Carla really was. Okay, the day of the attack, Carla actually came past Solomon here and he was out just about where he is now. She basically climbed up to the fence, but he didn't do that. Walked along here. While she was doing that, Joe was coming around the other side of Brian's pool there. It's going to be a bit hairy here because we've got a male and a female with a nest. She wandered up to here, near this tree, and she actually just jumped down. And um, I said to everyone, look, here's the pussycat of crocodiles. If there's any crocodile, Solomon's the pussycat of crocodiles. And she walked over here to Solomon and actually banged him in the tail with a bucket, made, try and make him turn around. Let's come on. And he came around. As he did that, she sort of slipped over on a bum. But then he grabbed me on my left leg, on the upper thigh, and picked me up and carried me into the water and uh, I started walk, walking out of the shed and I could hear screams. I was walking around to the door of the enclosure when I heard Carla cry out. I knew something was wrong so I ran up and jumped up onto the fence and I saw that Solomon had her by the left leg and was dragging her into the pond. He dragged her into the pool. Come on. Into this little pool here. And as I'm going into the water with him, I yelled out, help dad, help dad, dad help, you know. I jumped over and grabbed her by the upper arm and I started to bash Solomon with the rake and Carla told me to bash him harder or harder. So he grabbed her on her arm as she got into the water around the shoulders and as Solomon was there he actually bashed him in the head like that with a sick a couple of times and actually let her go. Before Dad could pull me out he grabbed me on my pelvis area and that's where I heard my pelvis go crack and so I went Ugh! So he took the wind out of me and then he started shaking me and he only shook me a few times and took me right under the water. He then, after a minute or two, let her leg go. But before I could pull her clear, he actually grabbed her by the pelvis and went crunch. And Carla let out a big groan at that time, and he started to shake her. And then he shook her once, shook her a second time, and by that time, Joe thought that if he shakes her a third time, she'd be dead. So I threw the rake away and jumped across on his back and put my thumbs into his eyes. When I did that, Solomon let Carla go immediately and actually sank to the bottom of the pond. I pulled myself up out of the pond to my waist area because I couldn't feel my legs. And in my mind, I thought if I kick my legs, that's what attracts crocodiles. So that's a bad omen. I remember asking her whether he still had her. And she said she didn't know because she couldn't feel anything. But when I worked out the distance between where her legs were, and where I was holding his head that he couldn't have had her anymore. So I then stopped wriggling my thumbs in his eyes. By that time, Peter Basso had heard the screams. So uh, all I could really see was uh, Joe sitting in the pond, Carla on the, uh, in the water. Um, a tourist named Glenn, he jumped in off the fence, over the fence and grabbed my arm and then Peter Basso was there to grab my arm and they pulled me out of the pond. But that left Joe sitting on his head, holding his fingers in its eyes. Then Peter Basso come up and he said, where is he? I said, don't worry. He said, oh, I've got him. It's quite hilarious when you think about it. Um, then I decided, what do I do, you know? And he thought, well, how am I going to get off? Well, he couldn't come this way because Carla was laying over here. He didn't want the crocodile to come out this way. So he had to get out of the water over there. And there's only a gap of maybe that much. 
between the two pools. And uh, just as I got there, Joe jumped off the top of Solomon. So he launched himself off the crocodile in between that grass and just crawled out. I'll just try and show you. Through the grass here, he sort of came up this way. Come on. So with that, Solomon's just moved straight up after Joe, straight up into the grass after him. Come on. And he crawled out through the grass here. Cheated death, he did. Carla was still screaming, I mean, considering uh, what she'd been grabbed by and uh, her actual leg when we pulled her out of the water, this leg was actually pointing sideways. So you could actually see that he, he'd torn her in down the centre. This skull here is exactly the same size as Solomon's head. You can see why he did so much damage. Now the first bite got Carla across the leg here, just with the tip of the jaw. Now the pressure was so great, it not only broke the leg, it actually split the leg open. And the main abductor muscle just popped out of the leg. Now on the next bite, he got her a bit higher across the pelvis area here. And then he shook her a couple of times. Now, it not only broke the pelvis back and front, it also caused massive internal injuries. There's a few people in our family that will fight to the end and I'm one of them, Robert's one of them and Dad's one of them and Zeb's another one that they won't chicken out. They'll put their life before yours and I knew I was pretty right because Dad was there and it's the same with all of us. Luckily for Carla, Solomon had lost his teeth through fighting and bashing the concrete pool. Had he had teeth, I'd hate to think what would have happened. Now Solomon is about 29 years old now and he can live for more than 100 years. So he's going to be around a long after I'm gone. Now my father hatched him from an egg at Edward River and he only passed away last year. So Solomon has chased my father around, he's chased me around, he's tried to eat my niece, he's going to chase my son. He's probably going to chase his son, my grandson, and most likely chase my grandson, or my great-grandson. I think that should make him happy. <laughs>